Well, we are in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and last week we looked at verse 1 and 2 on slavery slash employee-employer relationship. It, it was interesting, especially talking about slavery from the Bible in 2020, um, you know, not knowing if the BLM is right outside or not. And uh, so you can go back and, and listen to that. It's interesting. I pastored for county assistant pastor and a youth pastor uh, close to 40 years, maybe over that. And, and uh, I've always learned where we're at in the word is really where we're at. It's not a joke. It's like, wow, it's always so applicable. And here's the cool thing is if you're learning something before it happens. I hate that when it's like, that's a great sermon. I wish I knew that two weeks ago. That would have been very helpful. But now I can't go back in time and, and apply that, those principles. So if you'll notice, God's talking to you about stuff and you're going, well, that really doesn't apply to me. Um, you know, I, I, I'm learning the good stuff. It does not, it's really not that helpful to my immediate life. Just tuck it away. And all of a sudden, in a couple weeks, you're going, wow, I just, that's just what we covered. And uh, it's the very thing that, that God uh, was preparing you ahead of time so you'd have his wisdom in that situation. Well, Lord, we come to 1 Timothy chapter 6 once again. Open our hearts. Give us grace to hear all that your spirit is saying to the church tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And I would like to say greetings to all those, too, who are watching online. God bless you richly as well. Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, uh, from which come envy, strife, reviling, and evil, evil suspicions. Now, earlier in chapter 1, Paul mentioned this, and, and he said in verse 10, anything that's contrary to sound doctrine, Timothy, you've got to confront these guys. Now, one, as we read First and Second Timothy, we, we realize he, he's probably not the A-type personality person Paul was. A mild guy. And even A-type personality, people have a hard time confronting people. You know, when I have to have a talk with somebody, oh, I can't eat, my stomach hurts, and days goes by, and you're stressed out, and it's just so hard. But if it's something you're doing all the time, that's why I could never be a police officer or a judge. Those two things, and knowing every day I'm going to have to go out and give people tickets or tell people what they don't want to hear. And, oh, it would just, I, it'd just be such a hard thing to do. Or a judge deciding the fate of a person's, you know, uh, life. Those are heavy things. You, you have to have a certain kind of personality to do that. But Timothy was having to realize that part of my job description, which I've not been doing, it's incredibly hard for me doing this. A matter of fact, I would rather quit the ministry than have to do it. That's what he's been asking Paul. Let me get out of here. I don't want a pastor. And he's saying, nope, you've got a pastor. That's the will of the Lord for you. And you also have to do something that's the opposite of your personality, most likely. It's a very hard thing to do. But you know, when you do those hard things, God does change you into the person he wants you to be. Hey, have you noticed that? I mean, isn't that what we do as parents? We make our kids do the hard thing. You know, pick up all your toys out of the floor. You know, you gotta, you gotta clean up the juice you spilled. You gotta, and, and go to school, even though you don't wanna go to school. You gotta do your homework, even though you, don't, you gotta brush your teeth. Uh, my, one of my grandsons, every night, he, when he knew it was about teeth washing time, you know, teeth brushing time, he just freaked out, screaming, screaming, screaming. You know, they got the fun toothbrush and the vibrating thing, the best kind of tooth, it didn't matter. 
It was, it was an hour of screaming over getting your teeth brushed. But a good parent is going to do it anyway, huh? And, and so Timothy had to realize, as any pastor, any leader, spiritual leader in the church, confronting those who teach bad doctrine or different doctrine, we've got to have a conversation. We've got to stop it. And, and you think, well, they're good people. They mean, well, you know, I don't doubt that. I don't think in Timothy's situation, these people were coming and trying to destroy the church either. But that's how powerful bad doctrine is. Well, it's just a bunch of words. <laughs> words are everything, guys. It's, it's an interesting thing when you try to picture a world without words. But then you start to think that God created this place in his image, and he is a verbal person. And the fact that we're made in his image and we have this verbal capacity, it's really a gift from God. To have those words, as James said, fresh water, we can heal, we can bless, we can encourage, we can strengthen. Or you can have bad words, salt water coming out of this tap. And what happens? You set forest fires and you destroy people and you cause wars with words. Yes. And so whatever the sincerity level of these guys was, Paul is saying, you don't understand. This is going to cause, cause church splits. This is going to cause disputes and arguments and it's going to create in people envy and strife and reviling and evil suspicions. Timothy, it's not a tiny thing that you can overlook, you know, sweep the dust under the dust mat, right? I remember, you know, I think every kid goes through that when they, they realize that almost everything in their room will fit under the bed. And they go in and they just slam it all under the bed. I'm done. Can I go play now? And you walk in going, okay, is everything under your bed? Ah, yeah, it's got to come out. You got to put it away. I, we've got to deal with it. Timothy, you've got to deal with it. Doctrine by doctrine, you, you've got to let these guys know what's going to be socially acceptable in the congregation. And uh, I, I personally... was acceptable. I had to agree with them. I, I, I had to say, look, you cannot be in leadership if you have more than one wife. I'll save the, I'll save the routine to the Friday nights at the... You're welcome here. Bring it up once. You're out from being a guy with some weird doctrine to a wolf. And, and uh, but however, if it's not sound in its doctrine, it can cause great studies where people are teaching something different in secret and, uh, and creating arguments for why they believe what they believe. But he says here, no, you cannot consent. If they cannot consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So interesting that Paul is saying that their very words disagree with Jesus. At every cult, whatever that cult is, Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses, whatever it is, they are always targeting to minimize Jesus. In Mormonism, Jesus is the brother of Lucifer. He was a man on another planet who elevated himself to become God. But Adam is the God in whom we have to do. He's the real God of planet Earth. Jesus had wives, according to the Mormons. Interesting. Jehovah Witness, Jesus is an angel. That's it. Now, he is an angel, the top angel. He became an angel who became a god with a little g, which, again, doesn't work even in their theology. Uh, if you can point that out to them, sometimes they, they go leaving scratching their heads. But here he's saying, especially if they are 
not being consistent with the teachings of Christ. And these doctrines, here it is, they don't accord with godliness. The proof is often in the pudding. The unhealthy doctrine produces an unhealthy life. Sound doctrine can produce healthy life, not necessity. In other words, I could have a very solid teaching here tonight and you could then go out and live a sinful life, right? But you're not going to have a solid, healthy Christian life if bad doctrine is what you're being fed. For sure, it's not going to happen with that. And so he's saying here, you can see where this stuff ends. In verse 4, once again, he said he is proud, knowing nothing but obsessed with disputes and arguments over other words which uh, come envy, strife, rivaling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourself. So you can see the key to their character, their nature, is they're prideful and they can't turn it off. They've got to be in their bonnet and nobody has ever taught it right but me. Have you ever met guys like that? It's like in 2,000 years, not Apostle Paul, not Jesus, nobody got it right. I got this revelation. And here's the truth. And it, and it comes from a false pride. You, you'll discover, it goes on to say, these guys really have nothing to be prideful about. That's why it's so appalling. It's like, this is a brilliant thought, and this is why you're prideful? Just to let you know, it's not a brilliant thought. And if that's why you're prideful, it's ridiculous. You have nothing to be prideful about. But it doesn't stop them. It's something in the twistedness of their nature. I, I, I've seen people that have been wounded from childhood emotionally. Some people have been wounded from other circumstances and relationships in life. Sometimes it's from drugs and alcohol and other reasons. Their brain isn't completely right. But yet, they believe that they are, have a spiritual uh, elite insight that everybody should stop and listen to them and their life will be fuller. And it's really just a very prideful, foolish person. Proverbs twelve fifteen says, the way of a fool, it's right in his own eyes. <laughs> you, you're not going to convince him it's foolishness even though it's foolishness. And when you try to argue with him on the merits of what he's saying, it's, it gets even crazier because he'll contradict himself and think that he made a solid point. I've seen this many, many times. It says they're oppressed with, obsessed with disputes and arguments. They, they endlessly want to debate it. And really, even these foolish guys, they get pretty good at debating people. Not necessarily on on, uh, wisdom, but just they become a superior debater. I've been to debates, many, many debates. Um, Sometimes, I mean, they'll go two or three days long, you know, in in four hours blocks, okay? And... um, And these debates, I mean, they are to the second. You know, you speak for 30 minutes, you speak for 30 minutes. And I'll tell you, you don't get two seconds longer than that. They shut you off. Because even if the debate, let's say, is four hours long, and one guy got to talk 10 minutes longer than the other guy, he has a great advantage of winning that debate. And people know that just by the amount of words. And so when I say these foolish people become experts of debaters, they just won't shut up. And and often it's it's going from one issue to another issue to another issue. 
I studied apologetics for many years, went to Simon Greenleaf School of Law and Apologetics, and, and, and it sort of gets nauseating after a while because they're all into this, this point, you know, and sometimes it's some Greek word, and, and, you know, it's sort of like, you know, how many angels can stand on a pen's head, you know, if, you know those kind of type of things, and, and people are just arguing and arguing and arguing, and, and you're just like, you're kidding. You, you actually are writing your doctor's thesis on this? It's, it's foolishness. It, it, it doesn't get you anywhere. I heard one debate, interesting, it was an interesting debate. This guy did not believe in the true resurrection of Jesus, but he believed in what's called the twin brother theory. Have you ever heard this one? This is where Jesus did not know, but Mary actually had two babies. One of them secretly was given away to another family. And he grew up thinking he was, he, he didn't, did not know he had a twin brother, nor did anybody else in the family. But this twin brother noticed, hey, that, we look just alike. And kept his distance to see if he could ever make this pay off for him. And so when Jesus died, he came up on the scene saying, hey, I'm Jesus. And uh, that's the resurrection didn't really happen. Now, you say, oh, that's just nonsense. I heard a four and a half hour debate, and this guy made a very good argument. Okay, I mean, stupid, don't get me wrong. But half of the crowd going in there agreeing with him, they all left agreeing with him because he, he didn't get blown out of the water, even on a foolish point. And so you got to understand who, who you're dealing with here. And these guys, they, 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 they create just one debate after the next. After the next, they get you focused on things that are irrelevant in the big scheme of things that's nonsense. But yet they, they get you and they get that going around in your brain like, you know, baby shark, do 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 daddy shark, do do you know, you can't get it out of your head. You, you, you ever... You know what I'm talking about, that song? It's just like, oh my gosh. Sorry, sorry, I got that going in your heads right now. But <laughs> this is what they do at these things. And what happens is they take, there is just no peace in the church. And what happens is usually the more solid Christians end up leaving the church, the real foundation of the church, because they just can't stand the arguments. They can't find a place of peace. So you gotta understand the big game plan of these guys. They are gonna divide one way or another. If the church is strong enough, the leaders are strong enough, then the pastor will stand. If not, uh, uh, that group will finally leave. But he's saying, Timothy, you gotta see this coming before it comes and don't let them have the damage. These guys are not bringing peace, but disputes and arguments. In James 3, he really nails this. Boy, this whole part of 1 Timothy really, in words of wisdom, almost poetry, explains it. In James 3, verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. So don't just let him talk about it. Let's, let's, see his, let's see this good doctrine being lived out in his life. And it's unquestionably wise. But if you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your hearts, you do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but at best, it's earthly, sensual, at worst, it's demonic. It's coming right from the pit of hell. These guys look like angels of light. They look like apostles of light, prophets of light, but they, just like Satan, who likes to appear as an angel of light, but it's really Satan, same as these guys. They appear godly on the outside, 
but they could be demonically being used. He goes on in James 3, verse 16, for envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Whew, I don't hear about that anymore. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is pure, peaceable, gentle. Here's three important words, willing to yield. I think those are the most Three most important words in this whole section. Those who are walking in wisdom can yield. They can shut their mouth. They can submit. They can, they can take direction. They're teachable. They're, this wisdom from above is also full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Verse 18 is the key. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, by those who make peace. But these guys, Timothy tells us, it's envy they're bringing about, strife, reviling, evil suspicions. So the, the church, this body, body of Christ, is now this place where they're bringing division and discontentment. And they may appear like they're experts in the Bible, but actually they are damaging the church. Envy and inward jealousy of those who are leading. They're not smart enough. They don't preach good enough. They don't know the Bible as well as me. They haven't, they don't, they haven't studied as much as I've studied. They're full of strife, which is creating again just unnecessary argument after argument, creating fire after fire that you as a leader have to put them out. Reviling. Try to create different camps in the church. Try to get everybody at odds and, and, and taking different positions. Proverbs 6 talks about this. In verse 16, it says there's 16 God's hate, seven that are an abomination, or that seventh one is the one. What is the seventh one? Proverbs 6, 19. The one who sows discord among the brethren. Though the one who brings division to the body of Christ. That's what they're doing. They have this elitist mentality. They have this superior attitude. I am so right about my doctrine. I'm so right about the way I look at things and everybody else is wrong. And, and they don't care if people get hurt. They don't care if it creates different camps of people at odds with each other. They don't care that the church is split and it actually gets weaker. They don't care. All they care about is being right. That spirit should never have had a chance to take root. We don't have to wait around until we see 25 tons of bad fruit. Okay? All we got to see is one limb. I, I grew up in a farming community. And during the October, November time is when you go out and you prune all the grapevines back. Freezing. Oh my gosh, cold. Like you couldn't believe. But the first thing you learn is sucker branches. So the grapevine pretty much looks dead. All the branches look dead and all the leaves are pretty much gone. But then there's this branch that's thicker and it's green and it's got leaves on it in October, November. And you're going, wow, that's the big thick branch. That's going to be the great, that thing will produce nothing. You actually can't just prune it. You actually got to dig into the very stock of the vine itself and, and amputate that thing out of there. You gotta scar up the main um, part of the, the grape vine itself to make sure there's no remnant of that sucker branch that can have any root. And then you take all these little dead things that look like they're never gonna produce anything and you just trim them at the end, just take a little tiny bit off. And of course, when summer time starts to come, those are the ones where these giant grapes are coming from those little tiny limbs that look like they were good for nothing. So to an untrained eye, you would do the opposite. <laughs> you, you would have done the absolute opposite and hurt that grapevine from becoming 
uh, the grapevine it was meant to be. So as pastors, we, we have people around us that have discernment. And I'll tell you what, I, I have had guys and gals in the church that I trust give me discernment on people that have come. And it makes my eye, you know, red, red flags up, keeping an eye. And sure enough, that's the very thing um, that was observed. I, I remember one in particular there was a guy that came into the church. He was just a very jovial guy, a very likable guy. Everybody liked him. And he was starting to serve in the children's ministry, doing a wonderful job there. And I had one of the, the moms go, there's something wrong. I don't trust that guy around my kid. And uh, had another mom come up and then one of the elders. And then all of a sudden I had two or three of them going, something's wrong with this guy. And so we said, you know what? We just don't have a piece about you being in the kids' ministry or around the kids. Be a part of the church in another way. But yet he couldn't do that. Even not being in the kids' ministry, he was around kids. And so I had to say, you're not welcome here. You've you got to go. And I, somebody had told me what church you went to next, and I called the church up and told them. Make a long story short, that other church was like, ah, well, you coward guys don't know anything. And... Uh, <laughs> The guy ended up doing something that caused great pain in the kids' ministry there in the way you think. So I, I do know that, that we don't have to wait for, for things to turn out bad. We, we know where bad doctrine is heading. And it also brings evil suspicion. It creates an atmosphere of mistrust towards the current pastor and leadership. It's making it's creating a, a, a worrisome in everybody that suspecting them of bad motives, of evil plots, and all of a sudden good is evil and evil is good. Useless wrangling of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. Trapp in his commentary says it the best. Endless, needless discourses. The Greek word signifieth galling one another with disputes or rubbing one against another, you know, irritating, rubbing, just give me some room here, man. It's as, it's as a scabbed sheep will, so spreading the infection. So it's like a sheep that has an infection on its side and it, it's hurting, it wants to get itched, so it'll rub itself up against other sheep to try to get itself scratched, but actually cause the next sheep to be infected. That's the way he describes uh, this term, wrangling of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. And they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Here's another telltale nature, a characteristic, is that this religion game here is a way for me to get wealthy. If that is what's being done, a man is becoming wealthy from the gospel. There you go. I don't think it's his only reason, but it is one of the backup reasons. From such, withdraw yourself. Timothy, don't have a conversation with them. Don't let somebody see you talking to them. And then it's like, oh, well, Timothy okays that guy because I saw him talking in the coffee shop the other day. So this guy who's now wanting to tell me about this new doctrine, he must be okay with Timothy because I saw them seeming to have a nice little chat. He's saying, don't, don't do that. Don't have any association with them. And so they, they, it can't by... Um, the fact that you're around them gives them legitimacy. Do the opposite. Don't associate. Tell your leaders, tell the people in the church, as we see Paul in 2 Timothy naming to the church certain individuals who had bad doctrine that was spreading like cancer. Well, sort of changing, in verse 6 he goes on, now godliness, to, to sort of elaborate on this point about money, Godliness with contentment is great gain. So first of all, godliness in and of itself is a wonderful treasure. But when it's coupled with contentment, then it becomes a great 
great prize. But again, those who try to say godliness is a means to get rich, the exact perversion of, of what Paul is saying. David Guzik has a quote. When one does not live by the itch of more, one's life is not dominated by shopping for, acquiring material things of, we can have the kind of contentment in God and his will for our lives. A truly rich man wants nothing more, but is satisfied within what he already has. Contentment does not come from the possession of the things one has but the peace of God, the riches of people, of fellowship, like-minded believers. Solomon says it this way, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver or gold. So if you're thinking the opposite of that, it's like, hey, they can think I'm an idiot. I just want, to, I just want a lot of money. Then, then you're probably the one who needs to hear this message. Paul says it this way in Philippians 4, verse 11 to 13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Here's a very famous verse we all know. Verse 13, for I, do, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We often quote that verse 13, not understanding the context in which it was being said. Paul said, you know, I can go into one place and I'm selling tents and I've got a bag full of money and I can, you know, eat the good food and, and you know, rent out the good hotel or whatever. But then I've been in places where we don't eat for a few days in a row. And our clothes are all tattered, as he talks about in 1 Corinthians at the beginning of that book. But he said, I've learned, I'm content. Whatever circumstance I'm in, I've learned to be content. What's the trick? I I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I shouldn't be content in that, in that humble, hungry, poorly clothed situation. It's embarrassing, sort of humiliating. It's hard on my body. But I, you know what? I, I still feel like I'm a rich king, even when I'm living in the most poorest conditions. And then at the same time, if I'm living in a very rich way because of where I'm at staying in some guy's house who's a millionaire and got, God touched his heart and, and I'm living uh, high on the hog for a, a while, it, it doesn't cause me to be prideful. It doesn't cause me to, to fall away from the Lord either. Either way, rich, poor, it, it, nothing moves me in my heart where I'm at from God. See, that's always the key. How full can your wallet be and you still have a full, rich heart towards God. You see, that it's always a difficult formula that God knows. Why is it uniquely hard for us in the Western culture, even more specifically us in the United States, to be content with what we have? Number one, we live in a consumer culture. <laughs> Boy, that's an understatement, isn't it? continual advertising that tries to make us feel discontent without that certain product. I saw yesterday on YouTube the new Hummer that's coming out in 2021. What in the world would I do with the Hummer? But I want one. Man, 15 minutes of just pure glory looking at the inside of that thing and hearing about all the specs looking at the seats. Just never know when you need a good automobile. And I thought, I wonder, I wonder how much that thing is. Starting price, $112,000. Starting price. That means no paint or wheels, you know? Yeah, that's, that's out of my reach. But man, 
how they can, they can, something that you absolutely do not need make you want to buy it. And then you buy it and you're going, what in the world did I buy this thing for? The second thing, it's hard for us to be content, is we almost always desire far more than we need. I.e., buffets, right? I mean, they, they never give you a big enough plate and you got that thing stacked 10 feet tall. If you eat all that food on that plate, it would be horrible for you, but we don't care. We want to get our money's worth. So we go back for seconds. The third thing is we need to continually remind ourselves that we can only find contentment when we live for eternal perspective and we long for eternal treasures. That's the key. It's hard in in this comfortable United States that we live in to keep thinking about eternal treasures. So many earthly treasures we could obtain to. Jeremiah 9 said, you know, don't let us, the wise man glory in his wisdom or the mighty man glory in his might or the rich man glory in his riches. Now you may say, oh, well, that, that sort of rules me out. I just took a look. The median income in the world for a household, $9,733 a year. Okay, but the real one you want when you're looking at these kind of averages is the per capita household. And that is down to $2,920 a year, a couple hundred dollars a month. And I'll tell you, I've traveled the world. I'm telling you, that's what most people do make. Okay, even countries that are, are doing much better than you would think like a Hungary or a Romania or a Serbia or a Croatia, even those guys are, are looking at somewhere around 10,000 a year anymore. 2,000 a month, they, they would, that would be a lot of money for them. And so if you look at those numbers, every single person living in the United States is a part of the 1% most wealthy people in the world. We know that, right? It's odd. You know, I've been down in the Amazon rainforest. They, they don't have electricity even to their house, typically. They don't have refrigerators. They're, they're salting their meats like they did back in the 18, 17, 1600s. It pretty much looks the way it probably did in the 1800s. But you go in and there's a, you know, there's a, a bar with the TV on and they're watching Dallas or Dynasty. You know, and try to imagine, you know, you're living literally in a hut. The church is in a hut. I'm not joking. It's a straw hut, no walls. That's church. They have another little hut. You're looking over there. That's the kids ministry. And, uh, you know, people are eating monkey and rats and snakes, whatever they can, they can get their hands on. But yet, they just love these American shows. It just blows my mind to try to think, what are they seeing? You know what I mean? But yet, here we are. We know it. We don't often feel it, but we should remember. So don't glory in our riches, but glory in this, he who understands and knows me, that I'm the Lord exercising loving kindness, discernment, judgment, righteousness, and all the earth, for these I delight, says the Lord. Well, in verse 7 and 8, For we brought nothing into this world, and as certain, we can carry nothing out. So having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. We came into this world butt naked. Okay, I don't think anybody, there's any exceptions to that rule. Not a penny to our name. And it's absolute certain nobody's taken it with them. You know, all those crazy stories, right? I mean, true stories where some guy will buy a brand new Cadillac and get buried inside the Cadillac. You know, there's a lot of funny jokes, right? Where the guy got mad at his whole family and, and uh, he told uh, the lawyer that he wanted all his gold and silver and everything buried, you know, all his wealth. He wanted all his money buried with him. And so the, the, they added up everything he was worth. It was like a million dollars or so. 
And so uh, right before they closed the, the casket, the, the lawyer wrote a check for a million dollars and threw it in there. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of funny stories about that. But I mean, the, the, the fact is, is um, whatever you have, it's for a vapor of time. It, it's crazy, isn't it? And it didn't really matter in our country if you're a poor person or if you're a millionaire, a big percentage of us are gonna end up in the hospital and they're gonna have that same little gown they put around you where your butt's hanging out. You could be a multi-millionaire, you know, walking around the hospital with his uh, little IV, or you could be a guy who just came off the streets, right, walking next to him, looking identical. I mean, we know that's true, isn't it? So the fact is, is that it's really not about what we can obtain on this earth. And the more we're holding on to earth stuff and it's important to us, the leaner our soul is. The sooner that we can realize we're going out with nothing. The only things we're going out with is who we are spiritually, who we are as a believer, how much treasure in heaven we've stored up. That's the only real thing that we're going to have for any length of time, which happens to be eternity. So he says, really, you just two things, two things, and you should be content. Some food and some clothes. You, you, if that's all you have, you, you shouldn't be bothered that you have nothing more. Interesting, isn't it? If you guys haven't seen on Netflix this show called Minimalism, you, you should watch it. It's this guy who, who, who basically believes that everything he owns should be in a duffel bag. And uh, it's his mentality. It's freeing. It's liberating. And uh, I thought I was making headway in that area until I had to empty out my condo and move into a house up here and realizing that we had everything in that condo that could fill up a big house. So we just packed it well, but we still had a lot of junk. In Luke chapter 12, verse six and seven, are you not, Jesus says, are, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear therefore, you are more valuable than any, than many sparrows. Skipping on down to Luke 12, 22 to 32. And he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you're gonna eat, nor your body, what you're gonna put on. Life is more than food. The body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they are neither sow nor reap, which neither storehouses nor barns, and God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? Continue on, verse 25. And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature. If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wow, that's, that's, that's a humbling statement, isn't it? The richest king that ever lived was not clothed just like one of the flowers. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Last verse, verse 32. Do not fear, O little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Food and clothing, I'm free. I'm free. And I don't even have to worry about that. God's going to work that out in his divine ways. Boy, I, I'll tell you what. I could tell you some incredible stories of God's provision for Cheryl and I. Even before that, and I can tell you, as a pastor of a church, what God did for Calvary Chapel, San Diego. I mean, just crazy, crazy miracles. I'm going to tell you one. We had 
we're building, uh, I don't know, one of the big buildings we were building. It, 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 anyway, we, we had, this is during the building boom, so it was very hard to get permits, and we'd worked for years, and we'd paid the architects, everything we had done with cash up to that point. But we were gonna borrow, uh, I think this one we were building like 80,000 square feet, and, and, and so we, it was like $4 million we needed. And it was all set and ready to go. And the Monday before the next Monday we were supposed to start, um, the bank said, yeah, by the way, you, you don't, don't forget, you've got to have 10% of that in your bank by this Friday. You can't get it from anybody else. That's be your money. At that point, we had very little in there because we were paying everything out of pocket as we were going along. And I don't remember exactly what the number was. A few thousand dollars is all we had. We basically needed close to $400,000. And, uh, and it was Monday. And it had to be there by that Friday. And we were just like stunned because if not, we couldn't start on Monday. And it took years to line everybody up to build this building. It was going to be about an eight-month building project. So it was really going to unfoil everything. We would lose hundreds of thousands of dollars in commitments we had already made. And we're just like looking at each other, a few of the board members and pastors and myself going, have we been in the flesh? I mean, have we done anything God didn't want us to do? Did we get ahead here? Or, you know, what's going on? No, no, we're writing God's will. It's like, okay, then we can't worry about it. There's just nothing we can do. Well, out of the clear blue, a guy in the church called up and, and he said, you know, I, I got some bad news. You know, I just, I just got laid off. But um, I, I did get a severance package and, and I really want to tithe on that. But I don't want to put it in the offering on Sunday because it's, you know, I just don't want anybody seeing it. Do, do you mind if I go ahead and, and bring that on in? This is on Wednesday or Thursday, we're like, sure, bring it on in. And it was a check for almost $400,000. Actually, it was a little under that, but the amount of money we had in our bank added up to almost exactly $400,000. I mean, just a few cents left on each other's side. And it just going, okay, God's doing it. God's done it. It's just so encouraging to see the Lord work things out in those ways. It's just fun. Sunday morning, I, I had this song in my heart from reading the Isaiah about the millennial reign. And I thought of this song I haven't thought of in 30 years. And I thought, man, I wish I had thought about this a little better. I could have told Mike to play that song. It was the very song he played at the end. And I'm like, man, when did you play? You know, when did you, did you see my notes or something ahead of time? And he goes, no, I didn't see the notes at all. I'm like, where did you come out of that? that he goes, I have no idea. I haven't played it in 30 years. Right? True, Mike? You can ask Mike. There's He's back there. You can ask him the story. So it's fun. It's just fun to see God in the midst of it. Those, those things are true riches, isn't it? To see God's hand work. So don't fear, little flock. Oh, could you just imagine being there? Jesus looking around at you, looking you in the eyes and say, fear not. Oh, little lambs, <laughs> it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Well, finishing up in verse 9 and 10, but those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and a many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Let's make it clear here that poor people can desire to be rich, but rich people can desire to be richer, right? I mean, in the equation of it, it's just as greedy. And, and let me just say here, being rich in and of itself is not a bad thing. Abraham was rich. David was rich. Solomon was rich. David, however, in Psalm 62, 10 says, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. He evidently learned um, that having money isn't a cure to, to your fears and worries. 
In Proverbs 30, Solomon says this in verse 8 and 9, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Too late. Feed me with food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of my God. So Solomon is saying, man, you, you don't want to really be on either end. You just want to sort of be in a place where your heart can still be crying out to God in faith. God, I need you. God, help me. Lord, meet these needs. Take care of these things. You don't ever want to leave that place where you need God in the equation of your life to get you through. You guys hear that? You, you never want to be in a place, even if it's a false place. See, riches can do that. A false elation of no need. But yet, it doesn't do it. They're just as empty, but they don't know it. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 19, that getting a rich man into heaven's like trying to get a camel through the eye of a needle. It's a very rare thing to happen. James 2 verse 5 says, God's chosen the poor of this world to become rich in faith. So do you want to be rich in money or rich in faith? Seems like rarely can the two happen. You say, yes, that's a hard thing to do to be rich and to have a lot of faith. But go ahead, Lord, I'll try it. Let me be your guinea pig. Um, yeah, everybody asked for that, right? <laughs> Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and a many harmful and hurtful lusts that drown men in destruction and perdition and greediness pierce them through with many, many sorrows. So having that heart of greed to be richer still or be rich is a destructive addiction. That greed destroys a person to try to get more, to have more, to obtain more. It's never enough. It's never enough. I used to have a, a friend of mine that, he was a crazy guy. He was wealthy. He owned a bunch of grocery stores. But he did this. I don't know if he didn't remember he did this, but he did this so many times. I'm like, Victor, don't do that again. Stop it. But he would pull a dollar out of his pocket and he goes, see, hear it, hear it? First time, I'm like, no, what? He's like, listen. Then he crumbled it up my ear. More, 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 more. That's what every dollar says. Give me more, more, more. It was, the first time, it was sort of cute. After that, it was sort of annoying. But I, I think it's absolutely true. Every dollar wants another dollar right next to it. Well, Matthew 6, verse 21, for where treasure is, there your heart will be also. Just a fact. Just a fact. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And you say, what is this talking about? Some people think it's talking about lust after women or whatever. No, the eye in the Jewish expression is a euphemism for giving or not giving. In Deuteronomy 15, 9, for example, he says, when that seventh year comes, the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you don't give him anything. Proverbs 22, 9, the generous eye, or the good eye, or the clear eye, will be blessed, for he gives his bread to the poor. Proverbs 28, 22, the man with an evil eye, a bad eye, an unclear eye, hastens after riches, does not consider that poverty will come upon him. So Jesus, in essence, saying is if in the area of giving, referring to our tithes and our offerings, or giving in, in the Proverbs in the case of helping those brethren in the church that are, are poor and struggling, if your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. So the way you're viewing money is what he's saying. And this is what he concludes with in Matthew 6, 24. No one can say, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one 
and love the other, or else we'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you just look at your attitude towards tithing and above tithes, giving an offering. If, if the pastor is talking about this, saying, hey guys, we, we should give the first 10% as a tithe to the Lord, and then above that, whatever's in your heart as an offering. And if you're here going, oh, these churches, all they want is your money. It's all about money, money, money. That's why I hate churches. And I don't want to have to give up 10% of my money. See, that would be, that'd end up being like $400 a month or something. That's too much. What are you doing? You're hating the one and loving the other. Clinging to the one, despising the other. You see, it's my money. I don't want to give it to God. I don't want to tithe. I don't want to give an offering. That's mine. There's a struggle going on. He's saying it's come down to all the gods in the world. There are many idols men can make. Really, it comes down to just two. The true and living God and how you view money. You know, it is pretty interesting that we've, we make up things. Like who ever decided a diamond was worth as much money as people will pay for it? It's just clear. Wouldn't you rather have some purple or green or red or something? You know, the De Beers Company, 1924, set out on the marketing campaign for the whole world which basically said, if you get married and you don't give her a diamond, you're really not married. And it's worked. It worked. We wouldn't even consider proposing to a girl without a diamond. Pretty smart, aren't they? So again, is it really worth what we're willing to pay for it? It's just a rock. What about gold or silver or whatever. If we, if we, if, if gold was as much as uh, the gravel that we see around, would we even give it any value if it was that, there was that much of it? But it's pretty weird. We'll, we'll, we'll lit, men will literally die getting gold out of a mountain to take the gold, melt it down into a square bar, and then what do they do? They go hide it in a safe somewhere. And so down in some bank two or three stories deep, you'll find all these things of gold that came out of one mountain and they got put into another dark area. And, but it's worth it to somebody if they ever need it. It's, it's foolishness. It's ridiculousness. And it, so it comes down to God or money. And so make your eye clear. Give unto the Lord that which is right. Honor the Lord with your tithes, your offerings. And and however the Lord is showing you, don't hold back. For the love of money. It doesn't say money. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Boy, there's so many stories in the Bible on this. You know, I think of Balaam. Remember him, the guy who talked, talked to his donkey? In Numbers 22, Balak come and said, if you can prophesy against these people down in the valley, which was Israel fleeing Egypt, they're going through the area of Moab. If you can prophesy against these people, I'll make you the wealthiest guy there is. And Balak like, man, I'd love to get rich. Three different times, God said, don't say a word against those people. Three times in a row, Balaam tried to curse them though. And finally, His donkey knocked some sense into him. (laughs) And he told the king of Balak, yeah, I can't prophesy against him, but I got a plan B. Just send your beautiful women down there and and tell them you'll you'll have sex with these young Jewish guys. Your your women are beautiful, but tell them before you'll have sex, they got to worship your God. Sure enough, that happened. And so Balaam is in hell, Jude tells us, but uh, he was wealthy for just a few days. He was a very wealthy man, but he died a few days later. Elisha, this guy Naaman, this Assyrian general, came in and he had leprosy and his young Jewish maid said, hey, go talk to this guy Elisha. He's a powerful man of God. And, and so he comes over to Israel. The king 
freaks out. Oh, you're going to get me killed. And Elisha says, don't worry, just send the guy over to me. And uh, as the guy was getting there, he just sent one of his servants to tell this great general, just go dip seven times in the Jordan. He was very offended by this that he didn't meet with them. But his guys talk him into it. The seventh time he comes out, his skin's like the baby skin, his leprosy's gone. He tries to get to Elisha and he wants to give him a bunch of wealth. And Elisha says, the gifts of God are free, not a penny, leave. But Elisha's servant Gehazi says, man, that was so much money. So secretly he ran after the general going, hey, Elisha changed his mind. Give me this much money. And he takes it and buries it. And Elisha says, what did you do? And um, the Lord cursed him with Naaman's leprosy upon that guy for being greedy. Boy, drowned, pierced through with many a sorrows. Judas, do I even need to mention how that story goes? Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. Yes, people who desire riches and they're willing to do what it take, whatever it takes to get the wealth will pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 12 about a guy that just gets radically blessed. He's got to tear down his barns and build new barns to take all his valuable produce in. And then he says, all right, now I, I can retire. I've got so much wealth, more than I'll ever need. And uh, he's just oh, fat and happy. But that very night is the night he's dying of a heart attack or whatever it was. And he dies. <laughs> and the Lord said in Luke 12, 20, God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And who will those things be which you've provided? So he, he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You don't have riches in heaven. Now, I might also say the opposite's true. We think of the story of the widow and her might. Jesus observing how everybody was giving. And out of the wealthy people out of their wealth gave their 10% or whatever it was that was right. But yet they made sure everybody knew how much it was they were giving to show off. But then there's this widow. All she had was like a 16th of a penny. She couldn't do much with it, but she gave everything she had. And the Lord observed her heart in giving and worship. And the Lord pointed out that this woman, from God's point of view, gave more than all those rich people put together, for she gave out of all that she had in worship. Then we think of the woman who broke the alabaster flask of oil, very expensive oil, and dumped it upon Jesus' head. Interesting, the disciples, in particular one disciple, in particular chastised Jesus for being so wasteful. You know what that word is in the Greek? Perdition. Judas was called the son of perdition, the son of a waste. He said this could have been give, sold and given a lot to the poor. And Jesus said, leave her alone. What this woman has done, she's done it to me, preparing me for burial. And what she has done will never be forgotten wherever the gospels preached this story about what she did and about what you said. <laughs> will be mentioned. And so we got to see that bad teaching can create some bad lifestyles. Especially if you're trying to teach, a godly life will be revealed by a bunch of earthly riches. Anything come to mind when I say that? The health and wealth gospel. We know about this gospel, don't we? It's on TV. These wealthy guys telling you that everybody who's righteous will always be healed and should have lots and lots and lots of money. And so they, in their homes, have all their faucets and their toilets made of gold. And this silly stuff, driving around Rolls Royces saying, right there, it's a demonic doctrine, the Lord says. I can tell you the damage it caused in Hungary. We first went there to preach the gospel. It was a beautiful, pure work. God did. But then these health and wealth guys showed up and said, hey, you want to know why America is so rich? Here's why. Here's the true gospel of Jesus. And these poor Hungarians kept giving all this money to this health and wealth gospel ministry, 
making themselves even poorer. And of course, after a few years, they weren't millionaires. So they finally said, ah, you, you're, you're phony. But then they were damaged. These people who had lived under communism never knew about God. Their hearts were so open to God. They mixed it up with, yes, here's about God and this is about making you rich. That's the whole purpose of this thing. It's a scheme to make you wealthy. And they're like, I love it. I get God and money too. Ah, I love this. And it so twisted them to try to talk to somebody like that about the Lord after they went through that. It was just devastating, guys. And so they were the biggest church in the country, like, you know, 5,000 member church. But when people finally realized it was a crock, it, it went much down in number, but the damage it caused was incalculable. So we used to call them, you know, the health and wealth gospel rejects. Back when I first started pastoring, the same type of thing with the vineyard movement. And it was vineyard rejects, people that tried to follow the false doctrine and it destroyed their life. And they come to us going, I don't even know if I want to believe in God anymore. We're like, no, 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 no. Believe in God. Here's the true doctrine. It'll give you peace for your souls, not uh, try to take advantage of you by their doctrine as these guys have done. Well, Lord, thank you for your word and just put it deep into our hearts here tonight. And cause us, Lord, just to draw nearer and nearer and nearer unto you. And Lord, we're warned, God. We, we know, we've seen it. Many of the faces of when I talked about the false teachers and their divisiveness and causing divisions, you could tell, Lord, that many here have experienced those things right here at Calvary Chapel, Los Alamitos in the past. And I have too, with many, many friends who are pastors as well as the churches I pastored. I do know that these things are real. And we also know that oh, having our hearts fixed in the treasures in heaven, where our treasure is our heart is also, is so important. Lord, let us be wise to store up for time to come, not to be a fool and only have wealth on this earth and not have much, much rewards and wealth for the time to come. So search our hearts with these scriptures. See if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way of everlasting. In Jesus' precious name.